and welcome to the announcement of the winner of the inaugural Newcastle Writers Festival, Fresh Ink Emerging Writers Prize. And uh, we started the prize this year for regional New South Wales writers. My name is Rosemary Milsom and I'm the director of the Newcastle Writers Festival. And I'm speaking to you from the unceded land of the Wabakul and why are my people here in Newcastle where I'm lucky enough to live and work. I pay my respect to elders past present and emerging, and I also welcome any Aboriginal people who are joining us for this event today. Shortly, I'm going to introduce you to our three judges who are going to comment on the entries of the prize. We received 80, which we were really thrilled about. And uh, I'm also going to introduce you to the four shortlisted writers. Alex Chorwell from Wollongong, Lorena Mason from Wanji Wanji, Rebecca Cheney from Forrester's Beach, and Nate McCarthy from Churros Head, and they're going to read a short extract from their shortlisted works, which you can also see on our website if you'd like to. Before that though, I wanna thank two key people or organisations for supporting this prize. Elephant in the Room Wine is a local business. Frances Crampton and her husband, Nick, started this business. And uh, Fran has been a long time supporter of the festival. She has been on the festival board and each year, the company sponsors part of our schools program. And because we didn't hold the schools program this year, uh, I asked her if we could um, reallocate that money to, uh, I felt a, an area that needed support, particularly with COVID and that's emerging writers. It's been really tough on the arts the past couple of years. And I think the festival's aim ultimately is to make sure that we have a healthy literary ecosystem and it was really important for the festival to focus this year on emerging writers. And that is how the prize came about. I also want to thank Create New South Wales. We were able to pay the judges and pay the wonderful Bastian fox Feelin, who has been the administrator of this prize. And so it's been really, really important to have that team and also to be able to support the judges and, uh, and, and Bastian and, and pay them during this precarious time. And Create New South Wales is our core funder and, um, and we really value the support that we receive from Create New South Wales. So thank you. Thank you, Fourth Wave Wine and to Create New South Wales. So that's why we're here today. It is really exciting. We were meant to be doing this in person at a special event at the 2021 Newcastle Writers Festival this weekend. Uh, sadly, it's the second year in a row that we've had to cancel because of COVID, but plans are underway for next year. We really hope that we can see you all in person, hoping, praying, fingers, toes crossed. Um, yes, it's, it, it's, been really, it's been really tough. Um, I just wanna extend my thanks to everyone who supported us in the past couple of years. But on a lighter note, it's fantastic to, um, to be here to make someone's career kind of go up that other step. They've got $5,000 that they can use for professional development. And I know that um, I'm going to be watching all the shortlisted writers very closely over the next couple of years to see how their career develops. Now I'd like to introduce our judges. Uh, Sunil Badami from Sydney, a writer, and, uh, and he has been an incredible support during this process. When you do something for the first time, it is a learning curve. And uh, he's an experienced judge, and uh, I really appreciate his input. And, uh, and we're also going to hear from Ivy and Inga as well. Thanks, Sunil. Thank you so much, Rosemary. Well, I have to say, if there was an award for best judging panel colleagues, it would have to go to Ivy and Inga. You know, we were all astonished and heartened by the range, the depth, the breadth of the stories and talent that we saw in over 80 entries to the French Inc. Award this year. You know, whether it was from the coast to the bush, from the city to the regions, every kind of story, every kind of genre, every kind of experience was covered in all of these entries. And in fact, the hardest part about judging was the fact that there was such little to divide not only those who were in the long and short lists, but also the vast majority of entries with only a few points between those and those who we see today. So we'd like to say how impressed and how pleased we are by how much talent 
is a fo- is around in remote, regional and rural Australia. And we really do hope to hear more of these stories. And we hope that those of you who are watching today, including those of you who may have entered but didn't make it into the short list or long list, will share your stories and tell the stories of your communities ongoingly and next year for the next Fresh Inc. Award. Thanks so much, Sunil. And it would be great also to um, to see if Ivy and Inga would like to add anything to that. Ivy, Inga, would you like to add anything? Sure. Okay. Um, I think what impressed me the most was the sheer variety. And I know that Sunil's already said that, but that's something that I really enjoyed. Um, and in terms of genre as well, you know, there was a lot of poetry there. There was uh, some memoir. There was some creative nonfiction. Obviously, a lot of fiction as well. Um, and I just had a great time with the, the sheer variety of entries. So that- yeah, I was impressed by the diversity as well. And uh, it's a good reminder of how diverse our communities are and our landscapes are and um, even what we would call remote, regional or rural, you know, just what a, a range um, of landscapes and communities and writers that entails. So lucky us. I'd just like to add one little last thing is, is that we did try to reflect that diversity between different genres, different experiences and different stories in the long and short list. To be honest, if we could have shortlisted 20 or 80 people, we would have. But we do hope that it does kind of give those of you who may be interested in exploring the work of these talented writers more a kind of reflection of just how diverse and how deep, you know, that kind of um, range of genres, experiences and stories was going from the future to the past, from the coast to the bush, from the present to wherever. It was amazing. I'm going to be interested to see how our shortlisted writers, you know, what they do next. I think it's going to be fascinating to watch what they do next. Now to our shortlisted writers. I'm going to introduce them in alphabetical order. But one thing they have in common, that their stories are all very different and that um, they all live on the coast and I think that their commitment to their craft comes out. I mean, I got to read the shortlisted entries after they were selected. They're the only ones I've read. I haven't read any others. So um, I'm going to go back when I have a moment after we you know, finish up everything and, and read through a lot of the other entries. But what I've seen so far is, has been fantastic. First cab off the rank is Alex Joel. He's from Wollongong. And Alex is going to do a short reading from his submission, which was The Anatomy of Laughter, which is part of a larger work. And uh, I'll get Alex to introduce his reading. Thanks, Alex. Hi, hello, my name's Alex. Um, Before I get going, I'd just love to say a massive thank you to the Newcastle Writers' Festival, to the judges, um, and to Elephant in the Room as well. Uh, it's, It's really quite delightful to be here at the moment. Um, so thank you. Um, yeah. So my, uh, my, my submission, my extract was from a larger work that I'm currently working on, a novel manuscript called The Anatomy of Laughter. Uh, it is a story about a new recruit to a hospital clown program. Um, it's based on my own experience working as a hospital clown across Australia. And yeah, I kind of was hoping to find something light, a moment of levity um, amongst all the kind of squall of the years that have been uh, and that's often what the job feels like so it felt appropriate to write about it. So the extract I'm reading comes from the end of the speaker's first day of his job trial at the hospital and although the team has invited him back for a second day of the job trial he's convinced he's done pretty badly. He's dropping off the keys um, and he's planning on making a quiet exit never to be seen again really. There's a stillness to the ward like ripples settling on a pond. I find the drawer, put the key away, and that's it. Apart from hitting send on an email tomorrow, that's my last interaction with this place. Someone calls, psst. The corridor looks like the undersea. Afternoon light seeps through the blue material of the closed bay curtains, through the observation windows to spill deep cerulean into the hall. The beep and hiss of a respirator calls like the knock and pluck of the tide. Someone in one of the bays shifts a curtain, steel rings clinking against the railing, and the light darts and swirls like it's filtering down from the surface. Echoing from the other side of the corridor comes a stream of laughter. I recognize the nurse, Irish, standing at the entrance to the last room. Psst. 
They motion me over, then face back into the bay. Another burst of laughter comes from the room. I go, quietly. Look, she says. In the back corner of the last bay, dinosaur PJs sits in a laundry basket on their bed. Their dad is crouched on the bed behind her, hunched over his daughter, holding both sides of the basket. A TV has been wheeled to the front of the bed. It's playing a point of view shot from the front, front cart of a roller coaster. Uh, dinosaur PJ says as their dad leans the cart back, rattling up the rail sleepers, cooing encouragement in Arabic as they climb a peak. He says something urgent, Dino braces. The cart tips over the edge. She flings her hands into the air, tossing them from side to side as her dad follows sharp turns, quaking the basket with the jolting of the cart, staggered ahs pouring out of Dino's mouth. God help her if they come to a loop-de-loop. -loop. I thank the nurse and back out, quick and quiet. My heart hurts. There's no air down here. I wanna go home. I wanna see you. As I take the lift down and leave through the auxiliary corridor, I pass reception. One of the only lights still on, lighthouse for all others pulling in. I'm through the entrance doors, out on the street, and it's not until I'm off the block that I think I can breathe again. Thanks so much, Alex, really appreciate it. Next, we've got Rebecca Cheney from Forrester's Beach. Welcome, Rebecca. Thank you for having me. Um, and just to reiterate what Alex has already said, I'd just like to thank everyone involved in this prize. I, it was completely unexpected to me that I would be shortlisted. Um, so I'm just overly flattered and just very thankful. And um, I'm really looking forward to hearing everyone else's words too. So my story is a middle grade fiction. And I basically started writing it when this 12 year old chatterbox character called Stu wouldn't get out of my head. And it's basically about a boy who must use his newly developed time stopping ability to rob the biggest casino in the world in order to save his non-biological little sister. Um, so I, I wanted to write something which showed that um, home and, and family is more than genetics and something that acknowledged the one in 20 Australian children who are now born using IVF technology. So that's pretty much about my story. So the reading I've got today is quite close to the start of my novel. And for a bit of context, it's basically comes in when things start to go a little bit strange for my protagonist. And it's in first person point of view. I shove my earbuds back in and choose a game. I don't look up until I've built my first Martian base. With any luck, this lame magic show is over and we can go grab some of that food. I blink and blink again. I glance left and right and left again. My fumbling fingers yank out my earbuds and my phone falls in my lap with a hollow thud. Because no one is moving. No one is making a sound. It's like they're frozen. I wipe my eyes, no change. Goosebumps line up like an army on my arms. Because no one is moving, except me, I'm panting. Rows of heads face the front or each other but none fidget, talk, cough, pass wind, nothing. They're as stiff as Grandma Betty in her funeral coffin. My little sister Clara is still on the edge of her seat. Her eyes are open as is her mouth, both like when she sleepwalks. Clara, her name comes out sharp. It bounces around me. Clara, I prod her warm arm, pinch it, knock on her head. Clara, I shake her hard, then let her go. She doesn't yell, doesn't slap, just wobbles to a stop, hands on the seat in front, while I shrink away and yikes. I slap my hand over my mouth and, and shrivel down in my seat. A nightmare. That's what this is. Yep, I so have the imagination to come up with them. Those two things vibrating on the stage. Two things white with rainbow streaks that ripple in waves. I swear the northern lights from my science homework have invaded Vegas. Two things shaped like, looking like those two magicians. If those magicians were ghosts, 
a sound like smashing glass. It's coming from outside the showroom. I slide to the floor in front of my seat and make a plan. Hide, already doing that. Scream and tell those ghosts I'm here, I stick a fist in my mouth. Cry, about to. Run, uh, legs strongly disagree. Noise, now there's no noise at all. Not even air conditioning rumble or background noise, nothing. It's a nothing silence. Get help, get dad. I peep over the seat in front at the rows of stiffs at the stage. The magician ghosts wobble on the spot, the only movement in the showroom besides me. Get help, get dad, run. I look through tears at Clara. Last time I tried to lift her, I dropped her on her head and hurt something in my back that I'm sure is important. Get help, get dad, then come back for Clara. I jump to my feet, swivel to face the exit and see it, me, a ghost of me, fluttering in my seat in rainbow colours from its lanky hair to its sneaked feet. A ghost of me leaning over in game playing mode, like I was. My shriek comes out as a squeak. Am I dead? Thank you so much, Rebecca. That was wonderful. Congratulations too for making the shortlist. The next person who's on the shortlist is Lorena Mason, and she's a semi-local, not, not too far from me here in Newcastle, and uh, Lorena lives in Wanji Wanji, and uh, her submission is called Brushed. Hello, Lorena. Hi, how are you going? Tell us a little bit about this story, a bit of an introduction. This story comes from my years living in Outback Australia, where I met my husband and had my children, and it reflects our desire to bring the Yorelawa language into our daily life and our desire for it to be around us and spoken by our family. So um, for want of a better way to include it, I, this started as a story for them and kind of evolved into more adult fiction, um, uh, but still definitely something to communicate my deep love and respect for that family and world that and um, we are so lucky to inhabit. Yeah, all right, so I'll get started. Um, this is from the very start. So this is the very start of the novel. Um, and it's obviously still a work in progress, but here we go. Dane Owen squinted under the restraint of fences, proximity to the outhouse and smoke that curled into the blue air. The feeling of being pushed from pillar to post sat like a hunk of spit at the back of his throat. He swallowed, adjusting the sticks surrounding the camp oven loaded with potatoes that had been salted by his father's generous hand. Things had tightened, most certainly, and would continue to tighten as long as they were off Bonda. Be right for sure, Bubba had said when he leaned into the screen door of their new Gundy. Look here, Gunny, pots and all, he whistled when they poked into the kitchen. The substantial wood stack in the corner of the yard the rotating hills hoist and the spindly bimble box were met with equal enthusiasm. Mallorca was secretly pleased at the state of the floors, imagining sweeping them daily and feeling a small pinch of pleasure. Better and dirt, eh, Gunny? Dane asked his mother, smiling at the gruffness of her face. She avoided his gaze, glancing here and there, taking it all in. The plaster rosette around the ceiling light, the floral carpet in the lounge, and the way the previous occupant's furniture had left indents where piled had become pressed down to floorboards, weighted rubbings. She considered how she might fit another armchair. Dane watched his mother, more interested in how she was taking all this than the features of the house. She's playing her poker face, he thought. It'll do, she said solemnly, lifting the sack of flour onto the pink form like a bench. For now. Bubba threw a glance toward Dane, grinning, saying, tough woman to please your guni any, as he, as he pressed her lips onto a smooth cheek. They were triangular, each another's edge, indefinable without the other. More than that, they were an island, and their fierce connection to mob, to community, to country, made them more like an archipelago. As Dane crouched by the fire, an oily row of yellow belly hung fresh and slick, from a curl of wire attached to the clothesline, waiting. Murmurs of acknowledgement had passed between the fish and the fisherman in his quiet, unhurried way. 
and gratefulness would swell inside him as their flesh warmed his belly shortly. Their gills flexed wide with the wire threaded through and their lips pointed to the bright sky. There was some tragic beauty about them, Dane reckoned, when fish were out in the air, like a secret told or a mystery spoiled. Someplace else, a diesel motor revved. The butcher unlatched his door and a broom brushed over the corner store's landing, collecting mostly dust, a cigarette butt and a crumpled paper bag that had contained assorted licorice just yesterday. Someone pushed their baby in a pram. The rhythmic squeak of the springs accompanied soft hummings as the mother sung up the day to her precious beerly jewel. Beyond these, the wings of birds circled, ravens scrapped over day-old wallaby carcass, a blue-faced honey eater patiently worked the bark of a red gum until it divulged a fat, juicy grub. In not quite a cognizant way, the fisherman knew all this to be happening that morning in his hometown, in part because those things usually happened, but also because he was ever-present. His mind was almost always within the place he was standing. Thank you so much, Lorena. Thank you. I know you're a little bit nervous. You did a fantastic yeah, job. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. And our last shortlisted writer, last but not least, is Nate McCarthy from Turos Head. And uh, Nate's uh, submission is called After the Fires. Take it away, Nate. Thanks, Rosemary. After the Fires is a short story. Um, Scott's been desperate to leave Sydney for a long time in his van, but he couldn't because there were the terrible fires and then there was COVID and the first lockdown. But uh, co the lockdown just ended and he's just burst out of Sydney in his van. Um, Scott pulled into a small town for a piss and an egg and bacon roll just before Kayama. Men's bathroom still felt strange to him. The separation of weeing and pooing and the use of public foyer space for communal pissing always jarred a little. Troughs were for animals. He thought that ever since nipping into the boys' toilets to retrieve a footy in second grade. Boys have two places to go, his best friend Mike explained at lunchtime. Troughs for wee, dunnies for poo. You pee in front of each other, Scott had asked, like you see each other's willies. Well, you're not supposed to look, Mike said. Strange, but Scott mumbled. I suppose it is, said Mike, sucking his black currant juice up with a straw. In a few hours, Scott would stop at his favourite headland where you could drive the van right into a grassy thicket behind a long sweep of beach. Barely anybody went there and the nights were quiet and starlit. There was never the threat of being woken and forced to drive on by a ranger. There were, of course, other threats, but it felt right. It was the place where he had once spoken out loud the things he most wanted, an ease with knots, a crowded table a voice that matched his hands. He cried on and off while he drove through to Maruya. The bush wasn't completely raised now, for months had passed, but what had been a thick forest by the highway now resembled a strange cash crop with one type of tree and no understory. The spotted gums that had survived were skeletal and black and beginning to be flushed with stress shoots, a lush decline. He wasn't above reading himself in the landscape. People could put out showy growth like crazy when they were all but burned up, he thought. And what was he doing, taking off at a time like this? Doubt spiralled out of him in widening arcs until he made himself remember the shut-up rooms of his flat, the malaise of smoke, the stockpiling of toilet paper and the endless waiting. There were worse things than being lost and knowing it. The sun was still high when he got to the beach and nosed his van into the little clearing in the bush right at the mouth of the lagoon that was almost open to the sea. A woman walked a dog far away towards the other headland. The shallows of the lagoon water were thick with ash. On the beach, the tide line was a twist of burnt sticks and seaweed and charcoal. It horrified him. Still, if the tide had to hold everything together, the old ashes, and new seaweed, then so could he. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for reading. I know it can be a little bit of a nerve wracking experience. 
Now to the pointy end of uh, proceedings, I'm going to introduce uh, Francis Crampton from Elephant in the Room Wine. Fran, welcome. Thanks, Rosie. Great to be here. You're going to do the honours of announcing the winner. I just want to thank you again for supporting the prize. You've been such a long-term supporter of the festival in general. <laughs> and, um, you know, to, to give $5,000 to an emerging writer for professional development is pretty extraordinary. So I know everyone who entered uh, would like to thank you and I want to thank you too again. I'm very glad to be part of it. I love the festival. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So do you want to do the honours of announcing the winner? Yes. Congratulations to everyone who made the shortlist. And I love listening to all your stories. So thank you for reading. Um, I'm very pleased to announce that the winner of the Fresh Ink Emerging Writers Prize for 2021 is Alex Chorwell for his story, The Anatomy of Laughter. Congratulations, Alex. So would you like to say <laughs> something? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, wow. Thank you. Uh, cool. <laughs> um, oh, Whew, it's thank you. That 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 that's really really special. Um, thank you, Francis, and and thank you to Elephant uh, in the room wine as well. I'm so sorry. I'm still running the past thirty seconds back over in my head to uh, fact check to see if it is real and to make sure I'm not talking over someone else who should be speaking right now, not me. Um, I, I, I just as, as well, like the, the long list and, and, and the, the shortlisted authors as well, the, the, the work I've read from you and I have heard read to me just now, I, I think is astonishing. Um, like it's just remarkable. Uh, and so to be considered, uh, within your ilk is kind of just a pretty tremendous honor. So thank you, um, for that. Um, yeah, and as to, to the three judges as well, um, thank you so much. Um, and, and to Rosemary and, and Bastian, um, you've both been tremendously helpful this entire time. Uh, and uh, yeah, like I, I was saying um, before recording started, that uh, without that support that um, Bastian had given me, I would not have written anywhere near as good an application. Uh, so Thank you, uh, and to Rosemary as well for your support through the whole process. Um, yes, this this is this is pretty remarkable. Um, thank you. What do you intend to do with the with the five thousand dollars? What are part of your plans for um, development? Uh, well, I was about to make a joke then, but I, I don't even know I can do that right now. <laughs> I've got a residency uh, in Tasmania that I uh, was successful in applying to. Um, and that was, that's kind of the, the really the foundation. I, uh, it's, it's, it's been a, a bumpy road during COVID. And so to help me with um, living expenses and to indeed get there, um, uh, that's pretty, this will, this will go a long way towards that. Um, in addition, the other thing I'm really interested in, um, clowning in medical contexts uh, has a, a, a long, bright, beautiful, colourful tradition that extends far, far, far beyond the tiny grain of knowledge that I possess. Uh, but I, I still think uh, to an extent it still exists on the fringes of medicine. Um, and so uh, some of the money I'm, I'm going to use to um, approach um, a few readers I have in mind who are basically uh, bestride those two worlds to just give um, uh, input into it to make sure that I'm speaking true to the more scientific aspect of it, to the uh, potential, what well, the potential I've seen it myself uh, anecdotally, but I guess to kind of give it that uh, air of legitimacy. Um, yeah, because I'm, I'm really passionate about um, bringing that story out. Yeah, I, I just did another check over to make sure I'm not speaking out of turn right now. Um, this is cool. <laughs> It's all right. I, I think we all feel a bit, it all feels a bit surreal. The whole past few months has been a bit surreal, so I can imagine this only enhances that feeling. Uh, Sunil, would you, as, as a judge, would you like to comment on Alex's work and, uh, and the decision the judge has made? I always remember one of my favourite writers, Graham Greene, talking about being in a burns ward, a children's burns ward uh, during the Blitz and listening to a family grieving over a young victim of a bombing. And he talked about how writers must have a kind of sliver of ice in their hearts, which is 
at once a kind of sense that writers must observe acutely and listen carefully and still think about the work as its own kind of entity to be able to improve it and to be able to speak to audiences wherever they may be in time or place. But I guess the thing is, is while you don't necessarily have to be a great person to be a good writer, and I certainly wouldn't argue I'm either, what struck me about Alex's work was that it was full of heart. You know, it wasn't just funny, it wasn't just engaging, it was honest in the way that it not only dealt with the narrator's own anxieties about working in a paediatric ward with children who are often very ill, but also the realities for families and the people who support them during a very difficult time that doesn't always have a lot of hope. Having said that, it was also very, very funny. And so for all of the judges, we found that that balance and that richness and the texture of the narrative, as well as the reality and the complexity to the characters and their experiences really distinguished Alex's work. But having said that, having listened to Nate, Rebecca and Lorena, all of you, despite apparently having some nerves, reading so confidently and assuredly and bringing your stories to life so vividly, I have to say, I hope you will enter the Fresh Ink Award again. And I'm definitely sure that the stories you've told and shared today are very, very important. I hope that we will see them on a bookshelf somewhere and that one day when we catch up at the Newcastle Writers Festival, you'll be able to inscribe my copy too. But congratulations, Alex, on a wonderful work. You know, I probably, I told you, didn't I, Rosemary, that I was a trainee clown in the south of England, although I think it was more based on the fact that I could fit the shoes. And you know and what so they why say about... it, Why didn't it surprise me that you once uh, were <laughs> training as a clown? Well, you know what they say about clowns with big shoes? <laughs> big socks. That's right. <laughs> they have very big socks. Congratulations again, everybody. It was such a pleasure to be able to read your work and to include you on our inaugural shortlist. In fact, the only thing I have to say I regret, as I mentioned before, is that we couldn't have long-listed or shortlisted even more people, perhaps the whole 80 that entered this year's award, but we hope to do so again next year. And on that note, I would like to extend an invitation to the shortlisted writers to attend next year's festival, fingers crossed, because as I said, this event was meant to be part of this weekend's festival and COVID got us again, second year in a row, but uh, you will be welcome to the festival. As, as my guest, you can come along and, and attend anything you want. And so um, please, uh, you know, visit, her, visit us. It would be fantastic to meet in real life. And, uh, and congratulations again. And if you'd like to read the, the work by these shortlisted writers, you can head to our website. There, there are the stories on our website. And thank you again, Fran, and thank you, everybody. Thank you to the judges and to Bastian, who's, uh, who's been the administrator of this prize. I appreciate everyone's hard work, and hopefully we'll see you again in 2022.